Good evening and welcome to Conservation Conversations presented by the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. My name is Kevin Kelly and I'm joined again tonight by co-host Gabe Jenkins. Gabe, Earth Day, happy Earth Day to you. How are you? Thank you, Kevin. Doing very well tonight. How about yourself? I'm doing great. Couldn't, couldn't be better, that's for sure. Well, you know, you know, you've already kind of kicked it off. Today is Earth Day. And, you know, as we think about how we celebrate the Earth and make sure we take care of it, for us, it was extremely applicable to highlight some of the programs that some folks really might not even really be aware that Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife does and what we manage and oversee. So I'm really excited to highlight some of the programs that we do uh, at the department. You know, a lot of times people just look at us as Fish and Wildlife, you know, the, the, the agency that does hunting and fishing species management, but we're so much more than that. So I think for a lot of our uh, folks, you would be enlightened to see what we offer and all the different suite of biologists and teams of people that we have working on uh, game, on animals that we do not traditionally hunt or fish. Yeah, and we've got two great guests tonight that uh, we'll introduce here in just a second. But before we do, we want to remind everybody out there watching tonight that uh, we'll be taking questions. Um, so go ahead and ask your questions in the, uh, in the little chat function off to the right there, and uh, we'll try to get them at the end of our episode. But, uh, Gabe, uh, who do we have tonight? So tonight we're going to be highlighting our Kentucky Wild program. Um, from our agency, we will have Laura Burford and Michaela Rogers. Uh, both of them work out of the Wildlife Division. The, the Kentucky Wild program, we're going to get into that, really discuss it and highlight it. It's a, it's a program that the entire agency is involved in, whether you're in marketing, wildlife, information, education, we all have a say in it, but Laura and Michaela play, play a very vital role in that program, and we're excited to have them come on tonight, talk about the program specifically, and then the different things they do within the department. So um, welcome tonight, and we'll just kind of kick it off with you guys and let you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do with the department, and uh, some of your interests there. So we'll, we'll start with you if you don't mind. Hi everyone, I'm Michaela Rogers. I am an environmental scientist and I'm in the wildlife diversity division for the department. Um, I have been with the department for the past three years or it'll be three years this June. And then before that, I also worked as a nine month seasonal for the department just to kind of give you a little bit of my background with the department. Um, and then some of the projects I work on here, I am our main point person for monarch and pollinator conservation. So the Kentucky Monarch Conservation Plan that we'll be talking about tonight. Um, but I also work with a variety of at-risk species. So bats, I do some hellbender work, um, some of our crayfish projects, kind of a wide variety, but most people here think of me as kind of our mon monarch and pollinator coordinator. Right, so one thing I'll, I'll point out, you said the wildlife diversity program. You've touched on some of those. Uh, kind of name off a few other things that you guys work on with your the other host of biologists that kind of falls in that purview, if you don't mind, Michaela. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple people that work on bats there. There are several people that work on our non-game songbirds. Um, there is a herpetologist who works on um, some of our reptiles and or many of our reptiles and amphibians in the state. Um, there's been a lot of work on or a little bit of work starting to come through on uh, crayfish and then a little bit of small mammal work as well. So kind of, again, a wide variety of different biologists that are working in that program. Gotcha, awesome. I just wanted to make sure everybody kind of knew what that meant, what all uh, different species that might fall into it. So thanks again for coming on. Uh, Michaela, we're looking forward to chatting with you some. So Laura, um, tell us a little bit about yourself too as well. Hi, okay, great. Yeah, my name is Laura Burford and um, I, I am a career fish and wildlife employee in Kentucky. I have been here <laughs> since 1994 and I started right out of college. My very first job with the agency was as a fish and wildlife technician on the Peregrine Falcon reintroduction program. So I started as a hack site attendant. I was nice. feeding quail to little baby falcon chicks. So fun <laughs> job, um, it kind of went up from there. I ended up coordinating the falcon reintroduction program and uh, we did that for several years, releasing falcons at different locations in central Kentucky. Um, I went on and became a senior wildlife biologist in the, it was then called the non-game program, kind of the same animal groups that Michaela was talking about. Um, I am a certified wildlife biologist with the Wildlife Society and 
I, I went on to work in that program for about 10 years, working with raptors, uh, setting up also some songbird monitoring stations and our survey routes. But then I made a little bit of a career move because one of the things I love about uh, working with wildlife is having the chance to talk with people about it and doing presentations and education. So I jumped over to our information and education division and eventually became an assistant director there. And I worked with a lot of the conservation education programs in the schools and also the camping program, hunter ed and archery in the schools. Um, but I guess at my heart, I'm a wildlife biologist. And so when the agency teed up the Kentucky Wild Program, I felt like it was marrying two of my favorite things, which are non-game wildlife and education. And so bang, I came right back. And uh, so over the past three years, I've been working as part of the Kentucky Wild team. Gotcha. Dang. Well, I, I think we were gonna we were gonna dive into um, Kentucky Wild and kind of explain to folks what it is, and it hasn't been around too terribly long, correct, Laura? That is correct. Kentucky Wild, as a program, has only been around about three years. We'll celebrate our third anniversary, if you will, in June. We started in, in June of 2018, but Kentucky Wild um, in name is something new. Um, but I will tell you that uh, from the standpoint of uh, you know, when I started my career, we were always hoping to have something like this. You know, if you live in Kentucky and, you know, I'm from Kentucky, I've lived here my whole life. Um, you know that Kentucky has a wide variety of, of wildlife and that's because we have such great different habitat, whether you're talking about wetlands in the western part of the state all the way to, uh, to eastern Kentucky and, you know, maybe you like bull elk, maybe you like watching songbirds in your backyard. You know, we have a lot to offer. And the great thing about it is, is that on Earth Day, we can kind of celebrate that because not everybody enjoys wildlife the same way. Uh, some people enjoy hunting and angling and they enjoy putting food on the table for their families. Um, but we also know that some people like putting up birdhouses in their backyard, or maybe they just like going camping or hiking and enjoying wildlife in all these different ways. But I think the thing we need to remember is that wildlife truly belongs to all of us. I mean, it is a resource that belongs to the citizens of Kentucky. And, you know, in that we, we have some responsibility to take care of what we've been given, you know, and make sure that generations after us can have the same um, enjoyable experience to, to uh, enjoy our wildlife resources. And fish and wildlife agencies have this awesome responsibility to be stewards of the wildlife on behalf of the citizens of Kentucky. And, you know, you mentioned this earlier, kind of in the intro, but a lot of people think Kentucky fish and wildlife equals game species. And yes, it does. We are very proud of our, of our hunting and our angling resources that we have and the things that uh, licensed dollars have been able to do. But there are a team of wildlife professionals that uh, work on these other species that make up the 90% of all the other creatures out there, uh, like bats and freshwater mussels and small fishes and salamanders, snakes, birds of prey, songbirds, butterflies, you know, all of those pieces are important and they're, they're all intertwined. And so just like hunters and anglers know that when they buy their hunting or fishing license, they're supporting these game management activities. Kentucky Wild was created as a membership program for folks that want to support the other conservation efforts that are happening for these other species. And that's not to say that if you're a hunter or angler, you can't be part of Kentucky Wild. That is actually just the opposite. <laughs> About 75% mm -hmm. of, our, of our Kentucky Wild members are also licensed buying hunters and anglers. So we know that our sportsmen and women in Kentucky understand the value of all of those pieces. And Kentucky Wild was born out of a need to give, to expand our partnership to those folks that aren't traditional users. You know, I was going to say it's kind of a tall order for us in Kentucky. You talked about all the the species that we have, but we're, we're blessed with that, but it also becomes a challenge that, you know, we have, when you look at species diversity as a state, we're one of the highest states in the country with, when you look at how we are from east to west, from the mountains to the, you know, to the swamps and wetlands and all the different creatures that that inhabits, it has a lot of different animals for us to have management over and oversight. So, you know, it's a challenge for us where some states don't have near the species that we have. So, you know, like you said, we're more than just, you know, deer and turkeys, but it's um, hellbenders or monarchs and things like that. So, and not all of them live here in Kentucky all the time. And that other makes a challenge. I know Michaela will talk about that some too, but we have species that pass through and we're very, very uh, important migration route through if, if you're a songbird or a pollinator. 
So uh, a lot of challenges for us that we think about 365 days of the year uh, in a variety of different ways. And I'm sure it makes you, <laughs> Laura and Michaela, I'm sure it makes your job one of the most interesting in the world. I'm fascinated. I mean, you could be um, going out, um, you know, surveying bats one day and then misnetting songbirds the next. And, you know, I mean, it's just incredible. You know, we talk about wildlife diversity, but the diversity in your roles has to make yep. it really satisfying uh, as a professional to be able to do that. It absolutely does. I mean, I'm a, I'm a little bit further along in my career than Michaela is. <laughs> we won't count the years <laughs> at this point. Um, but, you know, when I started with the agency, there were zero peregrine falcon nests in the state. There were zero, you know, and now we're finding them um, on bridges and, and buildings and even some that are nesting on cliffs. Um, when I started with the agency, I think there was one bald eagle nest that was kind of iffy. <laughs> it was off and on again in Western Kentucky. And now we're knocking on the door of 200 nesting territories for bald eagles. So to be able to have the perspective of looking back when there were none and now seeing how far we've come and how well good conservation works, you know, knowing that is encouraging and uh, it, it is very fulfilling from a career perspective. Definitely keeps us busy as well. <laughs> One day you're, you're out looking for bats. Another day you might be doing, you know, monarch vegetation monitoring or something. And the next you might need to go out and find the crayfish. So it, there's always a variety. It's fantastic. So you, you guys have kind of highlighted the things that you do. Um, let's kind of get back to the program itself in Kentucky Wild. So uh, we kind of hit the highlights of, of what it is. Tell me a little bit more about the structure and what it actually would mean to be a member of Kentucky Wild and what, what that looks like. Sure. Well, we kind of have two tracks with Kentucky Wild. We have one that is, we call it our sponsorship, and that's mainly geared towards business or industry, you know, small companies that would like to get on board and sponsor some of the work that we're doing. Uh, we have some fantastic sponsors, and I'm going to talk a little bit about them later. Um, but the other track that we have for membership is, is for individuals to join us. And and we have six um, membership levels for people to join. And no matter what membership that you join at, what level, um, all of our members receive quarterly newsletters that highlight some of the programs we have going on, tell you about our staff. We highlight some Kentucky Wild members and what they do to enjoy the outdoors here in Kentucky. Every year we produce an annual report showing you how we've been good stewards of your membership money that's come to us. Um, and different membership levels have different um, a swag that goes with them, like these totally awesome green t-shirts that we are all wearing that say I support wildlife. Uh, you know, all of, all of the levels have a different thing, but, but probably one of the most exciting part, I, I think definitely my favorite part is that one of the things we do for our members is that once a month, we will set up a, an invitation or an opportunity to go out and help us do work in the field. So we give our members the opportunity to come out and, and do work. It's not something we stage or set up. It's like, no, you're coming into the field. You might get wet. You might need to bring a raincoat. You know, we might have to postpone a couple of times. But when you're out there, we're going to put you to work. And um, that's something we try to do once a month. And as you can imagine, we'd love to take everybody. We can't. We have to draw names. Uh, we, but we do, um, we do try to do that once a month. And COVID slowed us down a bit because obviously safety had to be our top priority. Um, but now as um, we are, we're still abiding of course by the healthy at work guidelines, but we have, because our activities are outside so we can spread out right. quite a bit. Um, we, we can invite some of our members to come and help us uh, get really hands-on with the work we do. And just this month, we have been able to come back with two Kentucky wild experiences. We had a songbird nest box build here in uh, Frankfurt. And then we also took folks on a reptile and amphibian survey at Green River Wildlife Management Area. And that was a lot of fun. I mean, it's a chance for us to meet our membership, have people that have you know, similar passions all together um, and, and feel really good about the work we're doing. So I mentioned that we launched in June of 2018. Uh, we have, since that time, we have had members join from just about all of our Kentucky counties and quite surprisingly, 41 different states, which I, I'm gonna be really honest, I didn't see that coming. 
Um, but I, oh, in Canada, I can't forget that we're international. We've had an international right. member. Um, <laughs> so of course we're going for 50 states. We would love that. But even that said, we have a lot of inaugural members for Kentucky Wild that are repeatedly joined year after year. And we currently have over 3,000 members with, with new folks, join, new folks joining, joining every day. Um, and I mentioned earlier, a lot of our members are also licensed buyers, and we love that. We love that the sportsmen and women of Kentucky um, clearly see value in this program and, and understand just how important it is. We'll, we'll talk more later on in the program about how to join uh, mm -hmm. and a special offer. But I mean, if you're, if you're a hunter or you're an angler, when you go to buy your license, it's just a real simple click in the box and uh, to become a Kentucky Wild member in it. Uh, obviously, you know, we're going to be hearing more about the work that uh, uh, Laura, Michaela, and other biologists do around the state, but it's real easy um, when you go to buy your license. Some of the membership dollars have purchased gear for our section. Uh, we, it's amazing, really. I don't have time to name it all, but um, we have been able to purchase a centrifuge for the Center for Mollusk Conservation here in Frankfurt. That's extremely important in the work that they do. Uh, they have to feed algae to these young mussels that they are growing to restore back into the native mussel beds. Uh, so Kentucky Wild Dollars bought that centrifuge. They bought a water chiller for use in keeping the water the proper temperature to grow these young mussels. Um, switching gears, we've purchased kayaks, kayaks that are used for our prothonotary warbler surveys. And also we're just now starting to get some use during our Eastern Hellbender surveys that Michaela was talking about a bit earlier. Uh, we've also had membership dollars purchase mist nets for use during our songbird banding stations and also for our Indiana bat uh, monitoring that we're doing at different locations in the state. We've purchased uh, specialized nesting cameras so our avian team can go and check nest sites without disturbing the birds that nest in tree cavities, whether that be warblers or whether it be barn owls. Our, um, it's not just Wildlife Division too that is part of Kentucky Wild. I do want to mention that we have two outstanding biologists in the Fisheries Division that work entirely on fishes that um, are not considered sport fish. Um, these, these biologists are uh, tirelessly working to find species that are very rare and figure out ways that uh, we can enhance their populations. Um, so we have been able to purchase waders for them to do these surveys in these very, very remote streams looking for things like the Cumberland darter and the Kentucky arrow darter, maybe not as well known, but beautiful, beautiful fishes. Um, and, and also we've been able to buy equipment for um, our folks that are going out and doing the habitat work that is so important for so many species, not just, not just one or two, but a suite of species. Uh, we've been able to buy the gear that's necessary to do some prescribed fire uh, burns to improve the quality of open habitat for songbirds and, and pollinators. And pollinators are definitely the focus of a lot of our Kentucky wild activities because they are found statewide and they need our help statewide. And, and Michaela is leading the charge on behalf of the agency for this very important group of animals. So before we get to pollinators, not pollinators, I want to back up just one, one second and, and make a, a point or two. You know, when we think about hunting and fishing, we, we're, we're comfortable with buying a license and a permit, and then that gives you a privilege to go out and recreate whether you're hunting and fishing. Kentucky Wild is essentially built on that same concept, right? That you have a membership and then that membership pays for uh, research and in and, and the diversity program, but it also allows you opportunities to get involved. So it's very similar to how we do hunting and fishing licenses and permits. It's just there's not the consumption side of it. Uh, it's more of management monitoring and then getting you involved. So that's what's really cool about, about this. And then my second, I guess, would be more of a question is, are there any other programs like this in the country? Do other fish and wildlife agencies have a comparable program? Is this unique? Um, can you speak to that and what that looks like at the national front with state fish and wildlife agencies? I can tell you that there's not another program out there exactly like this. I can't speak yep. to all 50 states, but I can count on two hands how many have called to ask <laughs> about yes. our program. <laughs> We've had quite a few people uh, that are very, very interested in this model of how this is working. And uh, we love to get feedback from our members. I mean, we are trying to take as people give us suggestions and comments. Um, we're taking those to heart because the program is growing so quickly and, and we're excited. We're excited by the enthusiasm. 
Um, and honestly, it's, it's just been about all positive feedback. I can't think of anything that, yeah. that we've had negative, which is, which is fantastic. Um, but this is a program I think that is really resonating with all Kentuckians, not just our folks that don't hunt or fish, but our, our hunters and anglers too. And I think it shows that just how valuable our fish and wildlife resources are and by folks taking interest and not only wanting to financially support the work we're doing, but wanting to know what they can do on their own sphere of influence, uh, what they can do in their own backyards or on lands that they own. Um, it's really encouraging and we're, we're, we just know it's just going to be growing from here. Well, and then to kind of wrap this up, you know, it goes another example of how innovative the Department of Fish and Wildlife is here in Kentucky. I mean, we've talked on this show, Kevin and, I, Kevin and I have had the abilities to highlight all these different programs where we were the first or were the only doing these types of things. And then other fish and wildlife agencies are looking at us to model a similar program. So this is yet another example of us thinking outside the box, trying to find ways to engage the, the, the people of Kentucky into a, a different program. So kudos to you guys for doing this and uh, making this available. So I wanted to make sure we pointed, the, pointed that out this evening. I want, I'd like to jump in real quick. As, as someone who's not, you know, not a biologist, you know, hasn't worked at the department uh, for too terribly long, but you know, on the outside looking in, you always, and if, and if you hunt, if you fish, if you enjoy um, the butterflies and the songbirds, um, you feel compelled to want to contribute, you know, to want to get involved and help and kind of help the cause and be a part of this. I mean, you're already invested by um, whether you buy a hunting or a fishing license or a Kentucky Wild membership, but I encourage people, I mean, this is a fantastic opportunity to really pitch in and, uh, and, and help the department, help the biologist, help the, the wildlife, the habitat. It, you know, it's just like our Christmas tree recycling program. We see great response to that. And it's, it's evidence that people out there, our viewers probably tonight, you know, are looking for a way to get involved, to connect with our department. And this is, this is just a great way. This program is a great way to do it. So I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We just have so many points to talk about tonight. I know. This is the fun thing. It's such a cool program. But I guess let's transition back to where we were. So we're talking about uh, Michaela, I know this is kind of your bread and butter, if you will, for the things that you focus on here with the department. So touch on that, touch on some of the work that you're doing uh, with monarchs, with pollinators. You know, we're using that term pollinator. What does that mean? What are the different species that kind of encompass that? So we'll just kind of kick it over to you right now. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm glad you mentioned kind of the general term as pollinators because a lot of people think as pollinators as specifically just bees or butterflies. Um, but a pollinator is really any animal that moves pollen from one plant to another plant um, and that helps in plant reproduction. And so um, there's more than just bees and butterflies that do that. There's also moths, which people don't often remember, pollinators, um, beetles, wasps, some flies, um, hummingbirds, and then some small mammals can also be considered pollinators. Um, and some of the things that we kind of think about in regards to pollinators, so it's a really hot topic right now. Like, you know, you've probably heard not just around Earth Day, that pollinators are imperiled, we need to help pollinators. Um, and so it is a, a topic that's gained a ton of attention, which is great, but people often maybe don't know why that has gained so much attention. Um, and some of the reasons that people are really focused on pollinators right now are because there are kind of widespread declines. Um, and really, especially with bees and butterflies, kind of like we were talking before, um, but also insects in general, um, they're facing a lot of threats, which can be related to disease, um, the increase in pesticide use, and of course, the change in climate. Um, but one of kind of the biggest challenges that all pollinators face is uh, the loss of habitat where they need nectar resources and they need nesting habitat. Um, and a lot of the habitat that they use is either getting fragmented or, or developed and they don't have as much of those valuable nectar resources that they, that they need. 
And we also, we talk about monarchs a lot just because this is kind of one of our big focal species. It's obviously gotten a ton of attention. Um, the monarch also has kind of an added threat or, or added threats of having this large migration that it makes every year. And so, you know, they're impacted by some of the issues that I just discussed, but they also have to make this migration. So they can be affected by adverse weather. They can, um, you know, be hit by cars as they're trying to make their migration. There's really a whole host of different things that contribute to the threats around pollinators. So kind of get into, I mean, you've, you've painted a nice picture of the issues and some of the concerns with that, with all the pollinators. What exactly do you do with the department and what's your kind of your focus with trying to increase pollinator numbers and, and your focus there? Right. So I guess I'll really take it back to the inception of the Monarch Conservation Plan. We have a Kentucky Monarch Conservation Plan. This is my physical copy that I've got with us, but it's also on our website. Um, <laughs> if you go to the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website under wildlife diversity. And so this was kind of the jumping off point for um, monarch and pollinator conservation with the department because you know, around, I think it was the 2015, 2016 mark, a lot of people had been noticing that the monarch butterfly population had been, you know, declining um, by about 80% over the past 20 or so years. And so, you know, of course this caused a lot of alarm um, and a variety of different stakeholders got together to create the monarch conservation plan. And so, you know, this wasn't just state agencies, it did include us and other state agencies, but it included um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, it included private stakeholders, um, people that are in garden clubs working towards monarch initiatives, people from the agriculture community. So all of these groups came together recognizing that the monarch butterfly um, needed conservation help but also, you know, thinking about general pollinator issues as they were writing that plan. And so because the department created that plan, and that's something I mentioned earlier that when I was a seasonal technician, I, I actually started working on that um, then and came back kind of as our main pollinator coordinator uh, a year or so later. Um, and so one of my main focuses and what I do to kind of um, help pollinator conservation is to implement our monarch conservation plan. And what that means is that there's, you know, all of these stakeholders, there's six different sections in the monarch conservation plan. And so I kind of help organize those, um, those groups and kind of keep accountability for what's going on um, to, to make progress on the different initiatives in the plan. Um, oh, and I will tell you about kind of the contents of the plan to, to give you an understanding of how it's structured. There are six different sections that the groups came up with when they got together to make this plan. So it's education and outreach. So really just getting the word out similar to what we're doing right now and trying to you know make sure people understand that monarch and pollinators are um, in decline and that they you know need as much help as possible. We also have private and public land section of the plan. So that is what can we do? What can others do to directly put habitat out on the landscape that will benefit monarchs and pollinators? Um, we also have our research and monitoring section. So making sure that what we're doing is, you know, hopefully aiding and in increasing populations, um, monitoring the monarchs that, you know, we do see coming through the state. Um, our right of way section in the plan is kind of um, one that you might not necessarily have thought of, but it's our industries that have power line or um, gas right of ways. And that's areas that may have just been mowed fescue before. We, you know, we've been able to work with some partnerships and put pollinator habitat on those areas. And then our funding section of the plan, because of course every, every uh, initiative that you're gonna do at least needs some level of funding. So that kind of gives you a structure of how the plan operates. And so that's my position really is, is helping in all those different sectors and helping our stakeholders to carry out that plan. So, so oh, and I see we're both want to talk. So you're, you're <laughs> pollinator habitat. Tell me what that looks like. Uh, are we just talking flowers? Is there any, you know, explain that to our viewers if they're interested in creating something that would be good for pollinators. What does that look like? 
Yeah, absolutely. So one of the most important things for creating pollinator habitat is flowers. So if you hear me refer to nectar resources, you know, those are the resources that um, pollinators or many pollinators are using as kind of the food source. And so um, there's also, you know, bees especially need pollen and then, you know, things like butterflies, hummingbirds need nectar resources. So just getting more, I mean, it sounds, you know, pretty simple, but just getting more flowers out on the landscape, but not just necessarily any flowers. The most important things that you can provide to pollinators, you know, are things that are um, grown native and are local to Kentucky, because these are things that, all of you know these pollinators have had access to in the past so those are going to give them kind of the greatest benefit um, specifically for the monarch the monarch butterfly needs milkweed so that's the only plant that the monarch caterpillar can consume and the monarch butterfly um, specifically lays its eggs on con or well that was common milkweed that you all saw the picture of but any kind of milkweed plant so yeah. having your mix of pollinator or um, nectar producing species and milkweeds is really important pollinator habitat. So one thing I think that for our viewers, if it's something that you're interested in doing for, for pollinator habitat, it's really twofold. You can be active, right, in your, your plantings and what you put out, but it also if you've got fields and, and open spaces, just let nature do what nature does and don't I mean, we've, we've talked about this on some other things is, you know, don't cut the grass, don't brush hog as much as it, it feels good. And it's, it, you know, you look what I've done, look how clean it is. But in reality, you've taken away that habitat and by select mowing when you do uh, to allow those flowers to come up and bloom. I mean, you're, you're benefiting both the monarchs and our pollinators, but other species that depend on that. So that's the cool thing about, Monarch habitat is there are a whole suite of other species that benefit both game and non game from that. So you know, a point that I wanted to make sure we drive home is that all kinds of animals flourish when you do something like this. The you know, one word that has come up in, in multiple conversations that we've had over the past several weeks is fescue. You know, fescue, fescue, yeah. fescue. Why is it not good habitat? Laura and Michaela, why don't you explain? <laughs> We've Michaela, I don't want to talk over <laughs> top of you. Go ahead. Well, <laughs> it's just that we don't, it just doesn't really offer, you know, those nectar resources that we've been talking about. So it, it's, we're, we're not really at a lack of fescue. It's just that we kind of want to create much more of, of a diverse native landscape. So something you know, even if they're just smaller patches of habitat, there are, you know, different native plants that, that are more useful to the insects and, um, you, you know, other wildlife that are native to Kentucky. So they'll get a bit more value from something that provides, you know, either those nectar resources or a food source or something like that. And um, that's going to be much better for your, you know, attracting wildlife to your yard than best you. Yeah, so one thing I'd like to ask us specific to monarchs is when, you know, when do we see monarchs here in Kentucky? When do they spend their most time? You know, explain their migration to me. I think that's a very fascinating part you know, when we say migration and what people want to think when we say monarch migration and what it really looks like. So if you don't mind, just kind of touch on uh, monarchs specifically um, and tell us a little bit about their, their movement. Yeah, and, and like you were talking about, you know, with the monarch butterfly also having habitat that's beneficial to a lot of species, we call the monarch kind of our flagship pollinator. So it's our kind of our poster child. It is this vibrant, vibrant orange, bright butterfly. Most people have seen one at some point, so it gets everybody um, really excited. And so it, 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 it kind of helps to bring people into that pollinator conservation mindset that may not have thought like, oh, well, I'm really interested in bees or something. Bees are great too, but the, you know, the butterfly draws more people in. And the other thing about it is it's migration like you were talking about. So the, the monarchs that we, well, we will probably start seeing them. There have been a couple monarch sightings already this year, but we will likely start seeing them 
in early May. Some people say it's kind of around Derby Day. It will depend on the weather from year to year. Of course, we had that other cold snap. Hopefully, yeah, snow yesterday. Right? Yeah. We're about done with winter because they obviously don't like that very much. They want it to be much warmer than that. Um, so the monarchs that we will start seeing soon will likely either be the monarchs that have migrated to Mexico, spent the winter in Mexico and are now headed on their kind of northbound migration. So if you see a, a I guess raggedy kind of looking butterfly. It looks old, it has tattered wings, you know, it just it's it's just not fresh looking. That is likely a monarch that went all the way to Mexico and has come back and is looking for somewhere to lay their eggs stat. Yeah, I'd um, look I'd look pretty rough too if I had to fly from Mexico to this far, right? Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you see a really fresh, bright orange looking monarch, and you probably wouldn't see one right now, but maybe sometime in May, I would expect you to start seeing them. That's going to be your first generation monarch for the year. So that is the offspring of the, the monarch generation that just did the migration. So the first generation for the 2021 year will be that fresh um, orange monarch that you'll hopefully start seeing in May. And so we will have monarchs that arrive, you know, next month and they will stay here. Some will continue north, but some will stay here and they will breed. Um, we'll have a couple more generations. So we'll have generation two and three, um, and then that fourth generation for the year. So these are, these are uh, butterflies that are laying eggs, you know, the eggs are turning into caterpillars and uh, turning into a chrysalis and then emerging as a monarch. And so this is happening two and three generations down. And then that fourth generation is going to be the generation that you see again coming through on that fall migration. And they will head back to Mexico in the fall. Like our biggest months are September. It starts mid-August. September is our biggest month for monarch migration. And then a little bit into October, you'll still see them. But those monarchs are going to be going um, to central Mexico. They overwinter in the Oyamel fir forest. So these are high elevation forests in Mexico and they spend the winter there. Um, and they're clustered together in all of these, you know, all of these are OML fir trees. It looks like leaves because they're just all these orange butterflies clustered there. And then they will spend the winter there. Um, and then start to come back, you know, again in the early spring. So that's kind of where we're at right now, if that makes sense. I know it's a lot. But <laughs> it's incredible is what it is. Yeah, it really it is really to think is. about that, that small little butterfly makes that, that flight. I mean, we know about birds and, and waterfowl that migrate that far, but to think about a small little, you know, in, in a creature like that, that can go that distance is, is really cool. I think one of the most amazing things to think about is that the monarchs that are making the migration, the ones that make that fall migration, have never been to this area in Mexico before. They've never seen these trees that they come back to each year. I mean, it's just amazing to think that they, they, this new generation finds it each year, the ones that their great, great, great <laughs> uh, grandparents found before. Incredible. It really is. It's remarkable. <laughs> so when you think about it. But, well, we've, we've talked a little bit, you know, uh, about habitat and, you know, kind of getting back to the Kentucky Wild program a little bit and just how members and, and sponsors of the program have helped with uh, pollinator conservation. Uh, Laura, do you want to touch on this about sponsorships and, and yeah. certain projects and yeah, Maybe. let's do that. Let's start. Um, I, I want to give a shout out to um, some of our uh, really, really devoted Kentucky Wild sponsors that have made monarchs and other pollinators really the focus of how they want to help with Kentucky Wild. And the first one that I want to touch on, it was our very first corporate sponsor is Country Boy Brewing. And they have uh, these uh, Gentlemen at Country Boy are avid outdoorsmen, very, very avid hunters and anglers. Um, but they also have a really, really big interest in helping wildlife in Kentucky as a whole. And at their tap room in Georgetown, they wanted, when they heard about this, they wanted to install what we call a monarch way station. 
And that is a garden that has great nectaring plants um, and milkweed that would serve as a good place for monarchs to be year round, whether they were insects that were laying their eggs on milkweed, so they would have something to eat, or whether in the fall when they uh, have nectaring or have flowers that are in bloom that are good nectar producers. Um, and then monarchs that are making that journey all the way to Mexico could stop up for a little pit stop at Country Boy Brewing. Um, so what they did was worked with Michaela to select species that would be good for that garden. And then they went a step further and said, hey, well, how about we just invite Kentucky members, Kentucky, excuse me, Kentucky wild members, if they would like to come and help us install these plants and they can learn about what plants are good, how, uh, how to arrange them in the garden. Michaela gave a fantastic workshop there at the tap room and then they gave everybody a tour. So it was a lot of fun that day. And uh, Country Boy continues to be one of our, our most active sponsors uh, with that. So another one of our, our very active sponsors is Columbia Gas. And they are one of the stakeholders that, are, um, that Michaela mentioned earlier, uh, one of our uh, big players in the Monarch Conservation Plan. They are working very hard on their gas line right of ways to try to convert the vegetation that is there into something that can be useful for pollinators like the monarch butterfly. And they have gone beyond wanting to just look at areas that they have management over in their right of ways. And they offered to provide high quality native plant seeds specifically blended for pollinators to use in other areas. And this is a shot of our field at our Fish and Wildlife headquarters in Frankfort, Kentucky. And Columbia Gas purchased enough seed for us to do a little over 10 acres of plantings um, here at headquarters. And so that is a location that is, believe me, much more beautiful than when it started. And it is certainly much more friendly to pollinators and small mammals and songbirds and birds of prey <laughs> that come and hunt in that area. Uh, they use this area and it's a place that we can go now when we take when people come and we need to do uh, some training on monarchs and pollinator gardens we can use this as an example outdoor space to show folks and so it's put a lot of great habitat on the ground for us and we are very thankful that Columbia Gas made a commitment to to do that habitat improvement not only on their own lands but also here um, as a place for us to show folks at headquarters. Another one of our partners that is heavily involved again in the Monarch Conservation Plan um, is East Kentucky Power Corporation. And, our, and they, um, very similarly to Columbia Gas in as far as how they maintain their right-of-ways, East Kentucky Power is maintaining right-of-ways under electric lines. And so what they did was approach us about areas where we could collaborate together where their right-of-ways would cross over our wildlife management areas and we found a per perfect spot at Grayson Wildlife Management Area in Carter County. In, uh, East Kentucky Power was doing a right-of-way rebuild and not only did they offer to purchase over 20 acres worth of native plant seed to reseed back in, they helped our wildlife biologists uh, go through that area, feather some of the edges along the right-of-way, remove some woody debris that not, wasn't even necessarily under their right-of-way. It was just to help our folks uh, make a, a, a better area there for wildlife. And this is just a shot of the area after year one. I mean, it had such a phenomenal response in that right of way. And in addition to this, they have, it, it worked so well. They're doing a similar project um, on another one of our wildlife management areas at Lake Cumberland. And this one is just now, Michaela, I think I'm right, just now they got the seed <laughs> and it's ready to go. So it's not planted yet. It's kind of an in progress, but East Kentucky Power has uh, purchased enough of that seed to do 20 acres at Lake Cumberland, WMMA as well. And they've also gone a little bit of an extra step and collaborated with us to produce some pollinator pack seed packages for us to distribute at different events that we do with the Kentucky Wild Program. And these are little seed packets that uh, we're, we hand out at Salado and at different events that we go to so, so people can take a little packet full of pollinator wonderful plants and plant it in their own backyard. So we are just really, really excited about the response from, from these sponsors. They are very generous with their time, very generous with their resources. 
and are really making a difference on the ground by helping us put habitat in place that's going to benefit pollinators and a lot of other animals that use this kind of habitat. Oh, I missed the, um, let me share this one too. This is, a, this shows the Lake Cumberland. Um. Oh, that, it, yeah. <laughs> like I said, it's not quite as scenic as uh, some <laughs> of the other ones, but that's okay. We're just getting started on, on that. So that's yeah. all right. But, you know, our sponsors have, um, have been able to do this and, and certainly for their respective industries and companies, they are making environmental um environmental concerns, something first and foremost that they want to support. But I, I don't want to leave our members behind here too. Um, when our membership dollars are going in uh, and coming in, we try to divide them up over the different programs so we can kind of spread out the good for whether we're talking about birds or uh, reptiles and amphibians or freshwater mollusks. We have used some of our membership dollars to do things uh, specifically for pollinators as well. And uh, we have purchased bulk seed uh, that same native plant seed uh, that benefits pollinators. And we have done some, some additional plantings at headquarters. We've also been able to purchase um, very, very, very small milkweed plants, uh, two or three different species. That, um, we have to individually plant those into the ground. Um, we have done that as well at, uh, at our headquarters location. There's some pictures of that there in the center. Um, these are the seed packets there on the bottom left. These are examples of the seed packets that uh, we bought them in our first year with membership dollars. And then the second year they were produced for us by uh, East Kentucky Power Cooperative. We've also used membership dollars to purchase insect capturing nets. You can see some of those leaning up against our truck. We have used those in our surveys and tagging. We've also used those on some of our wildlife member, uh, member wildlife experiences. Sorry about that. And the bottom right, we even purchased monarch tags. And uh, this is something that Michaela might talk about here in just a bit, but when these monarchs, these amazing insects are making this thousands, hundreds of hundreds of miles of journey to Mexico, uh, we take the opportunity to try to catch them and tag them in the event that someone finds them. We've been able to learn quite a bit about the paths they take to Mexico. So all of those things were purchased there with membership dollars. And we're very, very thankful to our members that we were able to have the resources to do that. What information is on the tags, Laura? <laughs> well, Michaela, why don't you answer that? You're our monarch tag specialist. <laughs> so I was going to try to direct you towards the picture. If you can maybe see on the very bottom of the tag, there is a an eight digit code. And so that's kind of a unique identifier to each monarch that you tag. There's also in the little red section on the tag, it has monarchwatch.org. And so Monarch Watch is the um, group that, or they're the nonprofit that um, runs the tagging program. And then on... Um, I think on the top, I'm not sure, I can't remember what the other final piece of information is on the tag, but all of that links to your tagging information that you submit to Monarch Watch. So we will go out and tag and we'll write down the date that you captured the monarch, um, if it's a male or a female monarch, where you captured it. And so we submit all of that to Monarch Watch with the different tag codes um, listed by all that information. And so if someone does find that monarch again and, and submit it, then they can pull up, you know, where it was tagged from. So, you know, we've talked a lot about membership, whether that's corporate, uh, personal membership, but you as our watchers at home can do lots of these different things, whether that's reducing your mowing, um, but, um, <laughs> You want to talk a little bit about what you could do at home, uh, whether that's planning or, a, you know, Monarch Way Station, things like that that are directly related to Monarchs? Yeah, so I think kind of there's two sides to things that you can do with Monarchs. And um, I think the main one I'm going to talk about first is the, like Laura mentioned, the Monarch Way Station program. Um, she did a good job describing what that is. So it's a location that has both the, the nectar plants 
and the milkweed plants that monarchs need throughout their life cycle. So the milkweed plants that the caterpillar is feeding on in that photo. And then of course the adults need um, nectar resources. And so the, the importance of these monarch way stations are when monarchs are moving, you know, on their migration throughout the landscape, as many of those little dots they can have where they can stop and, you know, fuel up um, are, are going to make their migration just that more, that much more successful. So um, if you do have space that you could carve out in your garden, planting either you know, planting milkweed and nectar plants, and if you can, creating a monarch way station is one of the best ways to help monarchs. Um, and I was going to talk about, you know, what kind of the the best case scenario monarch way station looks like. And um, so I have another slide if you'll flip to it. There was some research out of the University of Kentucky. This was Dr. Adam Baker and Dr. Dan Potter. And so they wanted to look at, you know, Lots of people are planting these monarch way stations, putting in these gardens. And if you're gonna do that and you wanna kind of think about what's the best way to set it up in your garden, if you look at their diagram that they made here, um, they recommend based on what they found in their research is these little green circles are all your milkweeds. So kind of putting your milkweeds on the outside edges of your garden are going to help adult monarchs um, that are looking to lay eggs kind of hone in on those plants and find them a lot quicker. And so they've got their plants a little bit spaced apart in that diagram. Um, if you really wanna go you know, extra with it, you can add mulch to help them really stand out um, and hone in on those plants. And then they have examples of their nectar plants in the middle of the garden there. Um, so there's some good examples. You've got the Joe pie weed, iron weed, um, you know, indigo, that sort of thing. There's also bee bombs, purple coneflowers, prairie coneflowers, different fall blooming asters. You know, I could name a ton of, of um, nectar producing plants, um, but I also wanted to point out that I have this pamphlet on our website. It's a Wild for Monarchs brochure um, and, and wild ones. Some of the people that work um, on trying to promote native plants, they helped us kind of, well, this is really their pamphlet that we helped you know, edit for the Kentucky Monarch Conservation Plan. Um, and so this is up on our website and it has a whole host of different planting ideas that you, know, you can't read now, but it's up on our website under the Monarch Butterfly tab um, to give you an idea of what you can plant in your own yard that will help monarchs and pollinators. And one of the most important things to consider when you do have that garden that you're creating, if you can get something that's blooming in spring and then something blooming in summer and something with a fall bloom period, that more than any specific species is going to, you know, help your garden be the most beneficial it can be for monarchs and pollinators. And if you will put the other slide back up, I also wanted to talk about um, some of our different monitoring options that you can do. So, you know, not everyone may have space for a garden. Not everyone has access to a garden where they can plant things, but that is okay. You can still help with monarch research and conservation. And you can do that because there are so many different programs out there um, that these different organizations have put together to help with monitoring monitoring. And so all of these logos that you see are from different monitoring pro programs. Um, the top there, Journey North, is probably the easiest one. So if you're out and you see a monarch butterfly um, or you see an egg or a caterpillar, you can go to their website, journeynorth.org, and you can log that you saw that monarch. And that's one of the best ways that I use to track, you know, when monarchs are coming into the state. I personally have not seen a monarch yet this year. I'm really excited to see one, but I have looked on Journey North and I can see that other people have posted pictures and they have shown that they have seen adult monarchs. So I know that there's been sightings here. So that's kind of one of the easiest ways to get involved um, with some of the community science monitoring options. There's also things, the tagging um, monarchwatch.org, I mentioned that, and then Project Monarch Health. I kind of lump those two together a little bit because those are the two programs where you're physically gonna be going out and catching monarchs on the wing and you'll be you know, either applying a tag for Monarch Watch or with Project Monarch Health, um, you'll be sampling them 
for OE. It's a protozoan parasite that monarchs can get. And when I say sampling, don't, you know, don't worry about it. You're just sticking a little sticker on their abdomen for a second so it doesn't harm the monarch or anything. There's also the monarch larva monitoring project, which is in the green circle, the MLMP. That's going to be a good monitoring program if you have a small garden and you want to look for either eggs or caterpillars throughout the season. So kind of throughout spring through fall, you'd be recording and submitting the information to them. Um, if you're wanting to look at your small garden and see if monarchs are using it. And with all of these, or some of these, I guess I should say that one and the monarch joint venture, the integrated monarch monitoring program, there's a lot of them, but both of those are ones where if you're not seeing monarchs out, you can still record data and they're interested in that sort of thing. Um, but the integrated monitoring monarch monitoring program the immp is through monarch joint venture and that is one where if you're wanting to monitor kind of a large swath of habitat you have you know an acre or more and you're wanting to either look at whether ad adult monarchs or um, caterpillars and eggs are you know in your larger way station that is a really good program to use so all of these have websites that you can go to just um, google any of those any of those names we've talked about and you'll be able to register and get more information about each one of those. But there really is a ton going on with Monarch. So you don't necessarily, you know, have to go one way or the other. You can either do the gardening, you can um, monitor the garden that you've planted, or if you just want to look for Monarchs and record that you've seen them, Journey North is a great one to do that. We had a lot of success last year with doing um, a couple of these monitoring uh, events as part of our Kentucky Wild member experiences. And so we had a lot of success with those last year and we um, intend to be able to do those again this year. We did some mm -hmm. of the OE sampling with Project Monarch Health um, out at the Grayson Wildlife Management Area site. And then uh, we've done for the past two years now we have gone out in either late September or early October with some of our Kentucky Wild members and we have captured monarchs migrating through using uh, Perryville Battlefield and a, a location there that's been planted for pollinators. And it's a lot of fun. It's exciting. Um, and, you know, even when it was really hot outside, we had members running around with butterfly nets having a really, really good time. So we're hopeful that we will be able to do those experiences again this year, too. Well, so, um, go ahead, Gabe. I was going to just say, so as we transition, we've talked a little bit about this. Oh, oh, no, we've talked a lot about it back and forth, but <laughs> join. Somebody tell me how you join, what that looks like, uh, how, how does your sponsorship go, and uh, kind of the, the details of, of joining and what that looks like. Okay, joining is super easy. So what I'm going to do is direct you to our Kentucky Wild website. It is fw.ky dot gov slash ky wild and on that website you will see our current projects and it also explains our sponsorships and all of our membership levels and because it's earth day we're going to do something special for um, anybody that is interested in joining or maybe if you're already a member and you want to renew your membership no matter what membership you membership level you choose to join at you will get one of these wonderful kentucky wild i support wildlife t-shirts. You need to go to fw.ky.gov slash kywild and under join you enter the promo code earthday e-a-r-t-h-d-a-y and then we will get your membership packet out to you just as soon as we can including one of these really awesome t-shirts. All of us are Kentucky Wild members by the way. All four of us are Kentucky Wild members and love, <laughs> love the t-shirt. <laughs> Love the and they're a fantastic shirt, I got to say. They're I know, nice. it's, it's probably one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so, you know, make sure you join. You know, Laura touched on that. We have that promo code. That promo actually is, is good today, but it runs through the end of the month, right? But it's also mm -hmm. very important that you can get your membership by going through our actual fw.ky.gov website and the licenses. But if you want to take advantage of the, the Earth Day special and get this shirt, you need to go through that direct link. Uh, I've typed that into the comments in the, in the YouTube link. So for people there that want to see that, 
um, it is there. So we'll make sure that you're aware of that one um, and encourage everybody to join and reach out and get involved in, in this awesome, awesome program. Um, so one thing I'd like to do if we can is transition. We've got a few questions from some of our viewers. I'd like to, to read those uh, real quick, if that's okay. Um, so uh, we have one question. What kind of field work do you do to help monitor, help monarchs and other pollinators? I think we kind of touched on that some. So anything else you'd like to go back and revisit that uh, we didn't cover on direct field work on for monarchs and other pollinators? I think maybe the one that I didn't mention is that, well, I guess we did touch on most of the monitoring. Um, I do the integrated monarch monitoring program. So the larger um, the kind of larger area one that I was talking about with um, one of our WMAs, Cedar Creek Lake WMA. Um, and then another related to monitoring thing that we do is collecting data for the Monarch Conservation Database. Now, this isn't as much in the field, so it's not as exciting as getting out and, you know, getting to monitor monarchs in person, but I do collect data from all of our different stakeholders and submit how many, um, you know, how many acres or how many different management practices that people have done to benefit monarchs in the state. And so that's a US Fish and Wildlife Service run database. So that helps us along with our monitoring efforts track kind of, you know, how much is being done for monarchs. Gotcha. So I see one of our other our viewers pointed out, we were talking about the monarch tag. They said the top of the tag is the website address on how to go and, and look at <laughs> well, we'll look that up. So we missed that part of it. So thank you. Website address, yeah. Folks who are active in that. So thank you for watching. <laughs> so also we'll point out, you know, we've talked also a lot about this tonight. Today is Earth Day. Um, when you think about Earth Day, a lot of people want to plant a tree. Um, I challenge you to think about doing something different. Plant some monarch habitat, plant some pollinators, plant some flowers. You know, trees are cool and they're special, but you know, a lot of our our species that are in peril need grasslands, need flowers for this. So, uh, you know, do your part. Earth Day is about the celebration of Earth, whether that's planting the tree or planting different habitat. But uh, think about that and, and encourage folks to do something for the for the environment today. So one thing one thing to keep in mind with that, real quick. So a lot of um, a lot of folks go to the nursery uh, in the spring and and uh, pick out flowers or plants or trees. Um, ask, the, ask the professionals there uh, which ones are, are you know, native to Kentucky, which ones can attract uh, the species that, you're, that you'd like to attract. Um, definitely lean on, on them uh, for their knowledge. Uh, but I mean, there's plenty of resources online, books galore, uh, all of that kind of good stuff can, can steer you in the right direction there. And then, you know, one other thing I think that more on the national front that I, I want to hit as we wrap up is that, you know, being Earth Day, we had some exciting news out of Congress today. Um, there is a, an act that's through that was introduced. It's called Restoring America's Wildlife Act or RAWA. Um, would any of you like to speak to that or what that is kind of working through the, the, the process and what that could do and what it what might mean to Kentucky? I definitely would love to. <laughs> um, absolutely, because this, um, you know, if you, if you haven't heard anything else that we said, I hope you've listened to every word. <laughs> but yeah. this uh, Recovering America's Wildlife Act, if this goes through, this is going to be the biggest piece of, you know, I'm going to say when this goes through, right. it is going to be the biggest piece of conservation legislation um, in 50 years. It, it's huge. Um, you know, Wildlife, it's not just in Kentucky, um, but nationwide, globally, certainly, we're experiencing a wildlife crisis. I mean, we know that we already have some threatened and endangered species. We have some species like the monarch that used to be extremely common um, that are declining at some pretty upsetting rates. And scientists really are estimating that if we don't step in and do some really proactive conservation here for habitat and for some of these animals, we, we're really we're looking at having about a third of our species become threatened or endangered in North America. And that's, that's not where we want to be. Uh, we know as Americans, we, we have a high value on our wildlife resources. So the idea behind Recovering America's Wildlife Act 
is to look to the states and the wildlife professionals that are in each of the states. We know wildlife conservation can work if it's done correctly. We know that. And the problem is, is that we have a lot of work to do, but we don't have enough funding to work with. Now, right now, Congress mandates that each state fish and wildlife agency maintain what's called a state wildlife action plan. And hang with me here. I know it sounds a little bit dry, but this state wildlife action plan is developed by all of the land management agencies and uh, non-governmental organizations, universities. They all put their best minds together and take a long, hard look at the scientific evidence behind what is the state of our wildlife in each state. And we're looking at the species that we have, we're looking at what their specific threats are to their populations and what actions are needed to either stabilize or recover those animals. And in Kentucky, we've identified over 300 species that we consider in greatest conservation need. And so knowing that and knowing that we have a limited amount of funding, we have to prioritize where we can do the most good on the landscape, where we can work together with other land managers. Okay, so we have that in our plan, but what we don't have is the money to do it. What Recovering, American Wildlife, Recovering America's Wildlife Act will do, will dedicate $1.3 billion annually to state fish, and, state fish and wildlife agencies across the country. And in Kentucky, our portion of that would be about $18 million a year. So if you can wrap your mind around $18 million a year that we could use to implement our state wildlife action plan, that's what it's intended to do. And for us, what we're talking about doing is wanting to restore and improve habitat. If we can do that, we can help a lot of species in one swath. It's not just single species management. This is recover. This is um, taking habitat that might already be there and improving it, creating habitat in areas where there isn't suitable habitat now, not just on our land, we're talking about waterways too. This is terrestrial and aquatic species, but we wanna make habitat improvements. We want to mitigate invasive species. We wanna do things to stop wildlife disease. There are wildlife diseases like white nose syndrome in bats is one example that we have got to get ahead of. Um, and, and we want to do things that are going to help reduce our water pollution and deal with climate change. You know, there are some lofty, lofty goals, but um, as Kentuckians, you know, we know the value of nature. We, we value our resources. We enjoy outdoor recreation and our overall health and clean air and water is important to all of us. So when Recovering America's Wildlife Act passes, it will be the biggest conservation funding bill in 50 years. It has bipartisan support. Um, it is our responsibility as Kentuckians, I think, to support this piece of legislation um, because it will be a game changer for us. And if anybody wants to find out more about that, um, they can look at ournatureusa.com is the place that you can go to look. Um, you can find Kentucky's fact sheet on there and specifically how we would look to, uh, to use these funds when, when they come to Kentucky. So it's an exciting day for Earth Day. This, this could not be coming at a better time and uh, it, it will really be a game changer for us uh, when this goes through. So you know, if you look at that website and you're informed and you support this, what we encourage folks to do is reach out to your U.S. representative or, and U.S. Senator, you know, it, it's in the house right now, so that, that would be your representatives. Uh, but if it, it supports, we encourage you to reach out to all your Kentucky representatives. If we have some of you viewers that live in another state, look for your representatives in your state, reach out to this. Like, like Laura talked about, this could be huge for what we do at Fish and Wildlife and for all Kentuckians to help uh, benefit in your way of life and natural resources. So we're really excited about it tonight. You know, a little off topic for us to talk about federal legislation, but when you see what the dollars could do, nationally in Kentucky, it really is a game changer for, for what we do and specifically what you guys work on on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, and the monies that are coming in with Kentucky Wild will be a very uh, complimentary part of that Recovering America's Wildlife Act because, you know, uh, with funding, states put, have to put up their own funding too. And Kentucky Wild is one way that we're gonna do that. We know the constituency and the thoughts behind Kentucky Wild are wanting to help these creatures. We've got, um, and, and we've got a lot of very passionate members. So we're, we're looking forward to having this come to pass. Well, Michaela, Laura, thank you very much. This was fun tonight. I enjoyed this conversation. I enjoyed talking about these things. Uh, we got a lot of cool things going, uh, both here in Kentucky and also nationally kind of wrapping that up with Rawa. So 
Um, we thank you for coming on, sharing your experiences, and ultimately thank you for what you do. I know you have a high task uh, of managing all the different species and looking out for them. And a lot of that kind of goes unnoticed, but we want to say thank you. I, I know our members and our Kentuckians all uh, appreciate for what you do. And uh, best of luck in all your field work and enjoy uh, your time in the field soon. Yeah, thank you all so much and happy Earth Day, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Help us keep Kentucky wild. There you go. <laughs> Thank you all. So Kevin, kind of, kind of wrapping up uh, a couple things. You know, one thing I'd like to point out is um, folks, if you're around Frankfurt, come to Salado. Salado is a, our education center. Um, we have a pollinator exhibit. We also have a, a hive of, of honeybees where you can come and check those out. So uh, a neat opportunity to do that. Um, I, I really will leave you with the last couple thoughts is, you know, we're blessed as Kentuckians. We talked about that on how high of a species diversity we have in the state. You know, however, a lot of those animals need some help. And we, we heard from these folks tonight about that. And it's important that we do our part of conservation. You know, we're just not about hunting and fishing, but all the different resources that our state has to offer. So be a good steward of that resource. Stop mowing, cutting back on that. Get involved in Kentucky Wild. Plant some flowers that, that are both pollinator friendly and um, do the best we can for the environment. And, and really... Being it's Earth Day, I got I got to quote Dr. Seuss. I love Dr. Seuss, my, and my kids love him. And my my favorite one is the Lorax. And and quote from that: Unless someone like you cares a off awful lot, nothing is going to get better. No, it's not. So that's what I will leave with leave with you tonight. Is is Dr. Seuss and the wise word, the wisdom that he has to say for us. That's funny. Well. Um... To kind of wrap things up, you know, we want to uh, thank you uh, viewers for, for joining us tonight and hope you enjoyed the conversation and uh, just the information that Laura and Michaela have was just, uh, it's incredible. You know, I hope to get some of their coworkers on on uh, future installments of Conservation Conversations. They do some, they, they work with some amazing uh, creatures and critters and uh, do great work. So. Uh, if, you, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button at the, the top right of the YouTube page and then select the bell to uh, receive notifications of new content from the Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. We'll be back uh, here in a couple weeks on May 6th for another installment of uh, Conservation Conversations. And um, Gabe, I think we're going to highlight elk in the Kentucky Elk Program. Yep. Uh, so we will see you all then. Have a good night. Thanks again and happy Earth Day.